there was ever one pivotal time period for all of professional wrestling, it would absolutely have to be the 1980s. And one of the most major components of that totally was the WWF. The industry would never be the same as a result of Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation. How so exactly? Well, that's the subject of this episode, because today... We take so much for granted about how professional wrestling works that it's hard to remember or even imagine a time before wrestling was what it came to be. The schedule of major pay-per-view events, massive amount of merchandise sales, and national television were all brought to unseen levels thanks to Vince McMahon. And while the company that we would all know now as the WWE did begin long before Vincent Kennedy McMahon ever took it over, today we'll be focusing on the WWF portion of this promotion. As I've already covered some of WWE's early history as the Capital Wrestling Corporation and as the WWF in a prior video. But also because the awesome supporters over on Patreon voted to see a video about the 80s. And what could possibly be more 80s than the Rock and Wrestling WWF? Oh, and since we're on the subject, I do want to take this time to give a big thank you to my supporters over on Patreon, such as Andy Savardi, Baba Yaga, and Rick Rack. Thank you to everyone for all the help. Our story begins on February 21st, 1980, when Vincent Kennedy McMahon Jr. and his wife Linda officially incorporated the company known as Titan Sports in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. This followed the rebranding of Vincent James McMahon Sr.'s promotion, the World Wide Wrestling. Wrestling Federation being simplified for marketing purposes to simply become the World Wrestling Federation. Titan Sports would also apply to trademark WWF at this time as well. And we all know how that would eventually work out. Now, back then, the WWF was part of a parent company known as Capital Sports, and it was also a part of the National Wrestling Alliance. That's right. Okay, so I'm sure some of you are wondering to yourself, didn't Vince McMahon Sr. withdraw from the NWA back in 1963? Well, he did, before quietly rejoining again in 1971. And just to refresh, the NWA was an umbrella organization with other promotions working under it. Or better yet, as Vince McMahon once put it in an interview with Sports Illustrated, in the old days there were wrestling fiefdoms all over the country, each with its own little lord in charge. Each little lord respected the rights of his neighboring little lord, no takeovers or raids were ever allowed. There were maybe 30 of these tiny kingdoms in the US, and if I hadn't bought out my dad, there would still be 30 of them, fragmented and struggling. I, of course, had no allegiance to those little lords. So now, the stage was set. Roughly two years after incorporating the company, Vince McMahon would buy Capital Sports from his father and the other associates of the company, Gorilla Monsoon, Phil Zacco, and Arnold Scotland. However, this wasn't a straight acquisition. Vince Jr. had to pay on a monthly basis, and if he even missed one single payment, ownership would completely revert back. So the younger McMahon took out loans and made deals with other figures in the business with the goal of fully owning the WWF by the summer of 1983. This strategy proved to be successful, with Vincent Kennedy McMahon repeating what his father did 20 years earlier and withdrawing from the National Wrestling Alliance. This happened during the NWA's annual meeting in 1983. So now, no longer bound by the restrictions of the NWA, not that that stopped them all that much to begin with, Vince was now completely free to compete with all the other promotions in the country all he wanted, in order to fulfill his dream of creating the premier wrestling company in America and one day, the entire world. Now, in order to defeat his competition, Vince McMahon would need an army. And that's exactly what he got. He reinvested much of the income of Titan Sports into talent, many of which he acquired from other promotions in the NWA, which eventually led to some of them going out of business. But without a doubt, the biggest masterstroke of Vince McMahon's acquisition game would have to be the signing of a particular AWA wrestler who was coming fresh off an appearance in the hit film Rocky III. Of course, that wrestler was none other than Hulk Hogan. Hogan had previously worked for Vince McMahon Sr., who was opposed to him appearing in Rocky III. However, despite the disapproval from Vinnie Mac Prime, Jr. saw the potential in Hogan and chose the Hulkster as the centerpiece for his grand vision, and Hogan would end up winning the WWF World title the following January. 
Now, with Vince having his soldiers line up, he would start pushing into enemy territory, expanding touring and selling videotapes outside of the Northeast. However, if he was really going to score as a national wrestling promotion, Vince knew that he would have to have WWF TV on in as many American homes as possible. So McMahon began his plan to do just that. He purchased Southwest Championship Wrestling's time slot on a station called the USA Network, and he replaced it with his own show called All American Wrestling. He also created the nationally syndicated programs WWF All-Star Wrestling and WWF Championship Wrestling, as well as premiering the show Tuesday Night Titans. But this wasn't enough for Vince, as he felt that in order to really control nationwide wrestling television, he would have to sign just one more nationwide cable deal. Unfortunately, the only one available belonged to Georgia Championship Wrestling on TBS, the Superstation. This all led to Black Saturday, which I already talked about during my video for Jim Crockett Promotions that you can check out after this one. Although, just to quickly recap, Vince McMahon acquired the majority of GCW and replaced their show with his. The fans of GCW instantly rejected the flashy gimmicks and family-friendly programming of the WWF, as they much preferred their Southern-style wrestling. However, this wasn't Vince's only iron in the fire, as he had also struck a deal with another network, a new channel that was growing quite popular with the youth, a little channel known as MTV, to form what was known as the Rock and Wrestling Connection. This started when Captain Lou Albano met singer Cindy Lauper while on a trip to Puerto Rico. She asked him to play her father in her music video for Girls Just Wanna Have Fun back in 1983, the success of which was not lost on Vince McMahon. And so, just little over a week after Black Saturday, MTV aired The Brawl to End It All, a WWF event that culminated a storyline that had been crafted between Albano and Lauper, airing just one match that saw Wendy Richter, accompanied by Cindy Lauper, defeating the fabulous Moolah as managed by Captain Lou Albano. This event did really well and helped to expose WWF to a brand new audience. And this led to another show on MTV called The War to Settle the Score on February 18th, 1985. This time around, Roddy Piper attacked both Lou Albano and Sidney Lauper as a result of being sick of the whole rock and wrestling thing, only to have Hulk Hogan come to their defense. As a result, the show would see champion Hulk Hogan go one-on-one -on -one with Roddy Piper with the WWF title on the line. The match ended in disqualification when Paul Orndorff interfered with the out. Meanwhile, Hulk Hogan's friend Mr. T was sitting ringside and was also attacked after entering the ring at the end of the match. This set up the main event for the WWF's next major show, which was also Vince McMahon's biggest gamble of all time. WrestleMania. For you see, even though TBS didn't work out, Vince McMahon's deal with USA was still going strong, and the deal with MTV was a huge success. But even though WWF was making good money, it had to make even more. Life is good but it can be better. Vince McMahon wanted to tour in more cities and on more dates across the country. Only problem is that that kind of travel schedule required a lot of capital. So Vince McMahon gambled everything on one huge supercard event, and he would make this show different from other supercards that had come before by heavily focusing on the entertainment side of the equation. We're in the sports entertainment business, and there is a huge philosophical difference Vince McMahon followed the success of the Rock and Wrestling experience by featuring celebrities as the backdrop to the wrestling event, investing a lot in acquiring outside stars like Liberace, The Rockettes, and Muhammad Ali, not to mention the aforementioned Cindy Lauper and Mr. T. Oh, and also, a last minute appearance on Saturday Night Live didn't hurt either. And as it turned out, WrestleMania was a tremendous success, becoming an annual tradition, with WrestleMania 3, headlined by Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, being an even bigger triumph, leading to the creation of even more pay-per-views and WWF being solidified as the national wrestling promotion and eventually the global company that Vince McMahon had always dreamed that it could be. Well, there you have it, the early history of the World Wrestling Federation. Do you want to see more videos about wrestling history? Let me know down in the comments. And if you're looking for that video where I talked about Black Saturday, the link is coming up in just a moment. But before I go, I do want to say thank you again to all of my Patreon supporters, and thank you for watching. And as always, Dave knows.